Welcome back. Uh, this evening we're ready for another week of Read Aloud and we're in The Hobbit. And Gandalf has met with Bilbo. Uh, Gandalf's ready to take him on an adventure and it, I don't know if Bilbo's ready yet, so we'll find out. Okay, so let's begin. The next day he had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He did not remember things very well. And then he put them down on his engagement table, like this. Gandalf, T Wednesday. Yesterday he had been too flustered to do anything of the kind. Just before tea time, there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell. And then he remembered. He rushed and put on the kettle and put out another cup and saucer, an extra cake or two, and ran to the door. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say. But he, when he saw that it was not Gandalf at all, it was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt and very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as, it, as the door was opened, he pushed inside, just as if he'd been expected. He hung his little cloak on the nearest peg and, Dvalin, at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins, at, at yours, said the hobbit, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, I'm just about to take tea. Oh, pray and have some with me? A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came in and hung his things up in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at the table long. In fact, they had hardly reached the third cake when there came another, even louder ring at the bell. Excuse me said the hobbit, and he went off into the, to the door. So, you've got here at last. That what was he was going to say to Gandalf this time, but it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf on the step with a white beard and a scarlet hood, and he too hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he'd been invited. Ah, I have seen they've begun to arrive already. He said when he caught sight of Dwan's green hood hanging up and hung his red one next to it, and Balin at your service, he said with a hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they have begun to arrive, and flustered him badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to Asked them himself. He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and he then he, as the host, he knew his duty, and stuck to it however painful. He might have to go without. <sighs> Come along in and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. Mm. A little beer would suit me better, if it is all the same to you, my good sir said Balin with a white beard. But I don't mind some cake. Um, seed cake, if you have any. Lots, Bilbo found himself answering to his own surprise, and he found himself scuttling off to, to the cellar to fill a pint beer mug and then to a pantry to fetch two beautiful round seed cakes, which he had baked that afternoon for his after-supper morsel. When he got back, Balin and Dwalin were talking at the table like old friends. As a matter of fact, they were brothers. Bilbo plumped down the beer and the cake in front of them, when loud came a ring at the bell again, and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought as he puffed along the passage, but it was not. It was two more dwarves, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade. In they hopped as soon as the door began to open. Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. What can I do for you, my dwarves? He said. Gilly at your service, said one. And Philly, added the other. And they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. At yours and your families, replied Bilbo, remembering his manners this time. Ah, 
Schwalen and Baden here already, I see, said Keely. Let us join the throng. Throng? thought Mr. Baggins. I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits and have a drink. He had only just had a sip in the corner while the four dwarves sat round the table and talked about mines and gold and troubles with goblins and the depredations of dragons and lots of other things which he did not understand and did not want to, for they sounded much too adventurous. When, ding dong ling ding his bell rang again as if some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle off. Someone at the door, he said, blinking. Mm. Some four, I should say, by the sound, said Feely. Besides, we saw some coming along behind us in the distance. The poor little hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands and wondered what had happened and what was going to happen and whether they would all stay to supper. Then the bell rang again, louder than ever, and he had to run to the door. It was not four, after all. It was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside, bowing and saying, At your service! One after another. Dory, Noria, Ori, Owen, and Glowen were their names, and very soon two purple hoods, a gray hood, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on their pegs. And off they marched with their broad hands stuck into their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already it had almost become a throng. Some called for ale and some for porter and one for coffee and all of them for cakes. So the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. A big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth, the sea cakes were gone and the dwarves were starting in a round of buttered scones when there came a loud knock. Not a ring, but a hard rat tat on the hobbit's beautiful green door. Somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage, very angry and altogether bewildered and bewildered. This was the most awkward Wednesday he ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they all fell in, one on top of the other. More dwarves, four more, and there was Gandalf leaning on his staff and laughing. <laughs> he had made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he put there the morning before. <laughs> carefully, carefully, he said. It is not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a popgun. <laughs> Let me introduce to you Biffa, Boffa, Bombor, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Biffa, Boffa, and Bombor, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods, a pale green one, and also a sky blue one with a long silver tassel. This last belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf. In fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Biffer, Boffer, and Bomber on top of him. For one thing, Bombor was immensely fat and heavy. Thorn indeed was very haughty and said nothing about service. But poor Mr. Baggins said, said he was sorry so many times that at last he grunted, Pray, don't mention it. He stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. <laughs> I hope there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No, no, thank you. A, a little red wine, I think, for me. And for me, said Thorn. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Biffa. And mince pies and cheese, said Buffa. And pork pie and salad, said Bombo. And more cakes and ale and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves through the door. Uh, put on a few eggs, <laughs> there's a good fellow. Gandalf called after him as the hobbits stumped off to the pantries. 
and um, just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. It, it, it seems to know as much about the inside of my larders as I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed, and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. Foster came him a bowl of these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen and feeling Keely behind them. And before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set out everything afresh. Gandalf at the head of the party with the 13 dwarves all round. Bilbo on the stool at the fireside nibbling on a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away. And trying not to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you'll all stay for supper, uh, said he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorne, and after. We shan't get through this business till late, and we must have some music first, now to clean up. Thereupon the twelve doors, not Thorne, <laughs> he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf jumped to their feet and made all tall piles of all the things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright. Oh, please be careful, and please don't trouble, I, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Shapes of glasses and cracks of plates, blunts and knives and bends of forks, that's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and bands of cocks, cut the cloth and shred on the fat, pours the milk on the pantry floor, leaves the bones on the bedroom mat, and splash the vine on every door. Dumps the crocks in a boiling bowl, pounds the muffles of thumping pole, and when you finish a fanny a hole, sends them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Bacon hates so carefully, carefully with the... Plates. And of course, they did none of these dreadful things. And everything was cleaned and put away safe as quick as light. While well, the hobbit was turning around and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing. Then they went back and found Thorne with his feet on the fender, smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and whenever he, wherever he told one to go, it went up the chimney or behind the clock on the mantelpiece or under the table, or round and round the ceiling. But wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of the thorns. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light it made him look strange and sorcerer. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings. And then he blushed to think how proud he'd been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he'd sent up the wind over the hill. Now, for some music, said Thorne. Bring out the instruments. Keely and Feely rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bombo produced a drum from the hall, but from Barf went out too. And they came back with clarinets that they had left among the walking sticks. Dwalin and Balin said, Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorne. Then they came back with vials as big as themselves and with Thorne's harp wrapped in a green cloth. It was a beautiful golden harp. And when Thorne struck it, the music began all at once. So sudden and sweet the Bilbo forgot everything else and was swept away into the dark lands and the strange moons, far over the water and very far from this hobbit hole under the hill.
The da came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and still they played on, while the shadow of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on. And suddenly first one, and then another, began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient home. And this is a, like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without the music. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away a break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of your made mighty spells, while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord, there many a gleaming golden hoard. They shaped and wrought, and light they caught to hide in gems on hilt of sword. On silver necklaces they strung, the flowering stars and crowns they hung, the dragon fire and twisted wire. They meshed the light of moon and sun, far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old. We must away a break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carve there for themselves, and harps of gold where no man dwells. They lay there long in many a song, for song unheard by men no elves. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night. The fire was red, its flaming spread, the trees like torches blazed with light. The bells were ringing in the dale, and men looked up with faces pale, the dragon's ire. More fierce than fire, laid low the towers and houses frail. The mountain smoke beneath the moon, the dwarves they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall, beneath his feet, beneath the moon. Far over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away a break of day to win our hops and gold from him. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands, and by cunning and by magic moving through him. A fierce and a jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go, and see the great mountains, and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls, and explore the caves, and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out the window, the stars were out in the dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in the dark caverns. Suddenly in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up. Probably somebody lighting a wood fire. And he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all to flames. Whew, he shuddered very quickly. He was playing Mr. Baggins of Bag Hand Underhill again. 
He got up trembling. In less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly, he found that the music and the singing had stopped. They were all looking at him, with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going? said Thorne in a tone that seemed to show that he guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. Eh, what about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Eh, of course, said Bilbo and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shovel with a crack. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorin speak. And this was how Thorin began. So we'll hear Thorin's speech next week. Okay? Bye, guys.